These images are from 2012, when anti-Japanese sentiment in China reached a boiling point over a few small islands between Okinawa and Taiwan. China has been at war for the last century both inwardly and outwardly, most recently transforming itself from a communist state with a centrally planned economy to an authoritarian state with free market economics, communist in name only. China has struggled to, to define itself and its role in the world since the Second World War ended. Its relations with its neighbors vary from guarded to hostile, and China has few friends. These relationships were defined during the Second World War, thus the war and how it is remembered greatly inform the geopolitics of Asia today. This is China's view of the world, completely surrounded by unfriendly states. On the mainland, China has had border disputes with almost all of its neighbors for decades, some involving military action, like the recent firefight with the Indians in the Himalayas. China's only access to the sea is to the south and east, but it's blocked by chains of islands controlled by states with which China has difficult relationships, a result of the region's history and especially the Second World War. China entered the 20th century less a country than a collection of warlords fighting for control, and much of the country occupied by foreigners. By the early 1930s, China was a failed state in a civil war, the two chief rivals being the nationalists headed by Chiang Kai-shek and the Chinese Communist Party led by Mao Zedong. In 1931, Japan looked west and saw opportunity. The Japanese invaded Manchuria, capturing it within weeks. Japan renamed it Manchukuo, installed a puppet government, and started shipping resources to Japan. This went so well for Japan, they decided to invade the rest of China in 1937. This time, Japan had underestimated their enemy. The Chinese decided to resist and resist in force. This was a disaster for Japan, which was never able to subdue the Chinese. By 1945, Japan had close to a million soldiers on the continent trying to contain the morass. The Chinese still refer to World War II as the War of Resistance Against Japan, which gives one a sense of how they remember the war. Chiang had been present at the Cairo Conference in 1943, which gave China a tremendous boost in status. The Allies had assumed that the Nationalists would ultimately prevail in the Civil War and began to fashion the post-war structure with that in mind. China was given a permanent seat on the new United Nations Security Council, one of five major countries with veto power. In 1945, the Allies viewed China as one of the powers that would monitor and police the post-World War world. A nationalist mainline China was not to be, however. In 1946, the Chinese Civil War resumed, with the nationalists being defeated, retreating to the island of Formosa in 1949. The U.S. perception was that the China they had been dealing with was gone, replaced by a hostile opponent in the new Cold War. China allied themselves with the Soviets and North Korea, engaging in direct combat with U.S. troops in Korea in October of 1950. The U.S. and China had become enemies. The Chinese turned inward for the next three decades, more concerned with domestic issues than their place in the rest of the world. The collective Chinese war memory was crafted by the Chinese Communist Party and centered around the theme that the party and its army, the People's Liberation Army, were the primary agents that defeated the Japanese. This was taught in schools, disseminated in the press, and shown in museums, the typical venues for crafting collective memory. The idea that China may have been liberated by the other allies or the Chinese nationalists was ignored. In the mid-1980s, with the death of Mao and the failure of the centrally planned economy, China turned to market economics and began to look outward. China has been pragmatic and has leveraged their strengths to become the largest manufacturer of consumer goods in the world. While still relatively poor on a per capita basis, China has become one of the largest economies globally. China is trying to change both the internal and external perception of its role during the war. China is often perceived as being a victim of Japanese aggression. China feels that this perception reduces the image of power that China hopes to project and has tried to show that it was a belligerent during the war, a power that fought successfully against an aggressor, Japan, and ultimately defeated them, not a passive victim. 
This narrative increases the credibility of China's claim to be one of the creators of the modern world. Historian Ron Emitter tells us that after the failure of communism, quote, a new form of non-class-based national identity was needed. World War II, with its message of shared anti-Japanese struggle across class lines, proved to be a powerful vehicle for that new nationalism, close quote. China is using the war for political purposes today. China's ambitions have changed. The internal workings of Chinese leadership are often opaque, but many of China's goals are clear. China's behavior also tells us that it wants respect, something it sees as its due, and, despite what they say publicly, China wants to project power. China sees itself as the next superpower and wants to be treated as such. Mitter tells us, quote, there is little doubt that China is seeking to exercise regional dominance in Asia with aspirations to a more global reach, close quote. Achieving this will require military power. China has increased its military budget massively over the last few decades and has more people in uniform than any other nation in the world. China has been working for years to create a world-class air force and navy, and a navy isn't much use unless one can deploy it, which is one of the biggest issues facing China. How to gain unfettered access to the Pacific and the world's sea lanes. Their greatest obstacle is the Japanese archipelago, a long chain of islands running from Russia to Taiwan, completely blocking free access to the Pacific. This makes China's relationship with Japan extremely important geopolitically, and they do not get along well, a direct result of the Second World War. Japan remembers the war very differently than China and is regarded as never having come to terms with their behavior during the war never showing contrition, and never apologizing. Historian Jennifer Lind makes a strong case that apologies aren't nearly as important as the perception that the former belligerent is no longer a threat. Lind gives the example that even though Germany never formally apologized for the invasion of France, Germany and France are now close since France no longer perceives Germany as a threat. Lynn states that how a country remembers the war internally is the most important factor in how it is perceived externally. For example, what their textbooks say and what kind of memorials they have is instructive. Japan's attitude has not been lost on China. Lynn states that, quote, the Chinese observe Japanese remembrance and specifically connect their distrust of Japan to its denials of past violence, close quote. Despite this mistrust, the Chinese have been in talks recently with Japan, which has lowered the temperature a bit. It's far too early to see how this may play out, however. Closer to home, China has had what is known as a one-China policy for years, making life difficult for any entity that treats Taiwan as a sovereign state. China has openly stated that it considers it only a matter of time before Taiwan is reunited with the mainland. Taiwan has other plans, however, and is both heavily armed and highly defensible from attack. Taiwan's mountainous terrain and lack of coastal plains make it especially difficult to take via amphibious assault, something mainland China has no experience with nor known capability of. Many analysts believe China could actually lose a war with Taiwan, especially if the U.S. and Taiwan's neighbors come to its defense. China uses a combination of charm and force to get what it needs. China has laid claim to the entire South China Sea and has dredged and militarized a few small islands near the western Philippines called the Spratlys. This has been successfully disputed legally in The Hague by other countries, but the Chinese are unmoved. China has also been using a technique the Americans have used for years, sometimes called checkbook diplomacy lending funds to poorer nations in exchange for military basing rights. China has been increasing investment in Indonesia aggressively, to quote an Indonesian newspaper. While China hasn't built any military bases in Indonesia yet, they have built permanent shipping facilities, which could easily be militarized and are engaging in joint military training operations with Indonesia. China has also been working with fellow authoritarian President Duterte of the Philippines to improve their relationship with mixed results. While the Philippines has drifted towards authoritarian rule under Duterte, they have shown little interest in being annexed by China, as squabbles in the South China Sea illustrate.
The Second World War redefined borders, relationships, and economic ties, most of which are still in place today. Much of the contentiousness between the Chinese and the West has been because of a difference in basic goals. The United States has naively attempted to remake the world in its image, believing that all people want democracy and freedom. They are wrong. After the disastrous 19th and 20th centuries, the Chinese people sought order, not freedom, and the communists delivered. China is deeply resentful of the United States, which it feels has forgotten the immense contribution China made to the war effort, considers itself a forgotten ally, and cannot understand why China has been treated as a new evil empire by the United States. The U.S. conversion of Japan from enemy to friend early in the Cold War was especially galling to the Chinese, who have never forgotten the atrocities committed by the Japanese and still distrust them today. China still sees Japan as an unrepentant neighbor, at best, and a potential long-term threat, at worst. So again, this is how the Chinese view themselves, surrounded by unfriendly hostile states and blocked from the Pacific Ocean. China has every intention of gaining the access it needs, and how China and the rest of the world deal with this conflict will shape the 21st century. Where this will go is anybody's guess at this point, but we are witnessing a change to the status quo, one that was established in the Second World War.